Welcome to the Adventist Healthcare and You podcast. We are back with a new episode. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Nimit. How are you doing, Shannon? I'm good. Are you ready to end the year? I sure am. All right. <laughs> well, we have a great topic today and two fantastic, wonderful guests. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Patsy McNeil, the Chief Medical Officer here at Adventist Healthcare. Welcome back, Dr. McNeil. Good to be here. Thank you for coming. And then we'd also like to welcome Dr. Wayne Meyer. He is the Medical Director of Primary Care at Adventist Healthcare. So welcome, Dr. Meyer. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are talking today about some top healthcare topics of 2023. I think these are the ones that you might hear often in your practices, but also kind of made the news in this area and that maybe you get a lot of questions about. So are we ready? Absolutely. Okay. All right. First topic, Ozempic and weight loss. Uh, I never hear that. (laughs) What's that? What's that? So we've all heard of it. It's been in the news quite often and Ozempic's not the only one. So maybe we just talk about this new class of drugs that not only treat diabetes, but also cause weight loss. Why is there so much interest in these, this new group of meds? Because they work. Okay. They do work. People lose a fair amount of weight by using them. I've had a lot of patients that were very excited about them which is wonderful. However, they do have side effects, Mm -hmm. uh, specifically things like bloating, slow bowels, and not feeling so very well. Yeah, not something people want to experience probably. No, no, no. No, plus, plus you end up having to use them for the rest of your life. Okay, maybe that's something people don't know, that it's long term. Um, If if you have diabetes, it's a very effective medication. That's what I was going to ask next. No, absolutely. I have a patient who has been on Ozempic, actually has not lost any weight, but his diabetes is in great control because it really does work on how well things are absorbed, specifically uh, sugar Mm -hmm. absorbed from your intestinal tract. I think that's a great point that the results that you see on Instagram or in the media is not what a average person may experience. And it sounds like, you know, each individual is different and the drug is there for a specific purpose. And if that purpose is met, then that drug is effective. But I guess the problem comes out with the social media aspect of it. You don't know what's behind the picture, right? You don't know if that person is experiencing bloating or if they have diabetes or whatever the situation may be. Um, and, And some people may be okay with those quote unquote effects or side effects, but is it really necessary to go through that to get the image you want? But on the other side, there are those diabetic patients who this is hugely valuable to and beneficial to. So there's a obviously a subset of population that this is beneficial to. And then the other subset, it may not be meeting their agenda per se. Unique needs. Exactly. True. So on this topic, before we leave it, what is your recommendation, Dr. Meyer or Dr. McNeil, to those that are considering it? Is it talk to your doctor? Is it what should we leave with? I would say absolutely talk to your doctor. Find out if there's any better answers for you. Find out if this is what you really want. And having a conversation with a trusted professional is probably the best idea. Always. And also, you you want to build a life in which you can sustain for decades and, and, you know, until you're not only older but just old. And the choices you make now will affect you later. And so it's very important to, as you talk to your doctor, consider the whole wraparound picture of your health with every medication you take. Thank you. That's wonderful. All right. So in terms of, uh, we want to talk about mental health. I think that's one of the topics that has been focused on a lot more of the last decade. I feel like it used to be in the back burner and now we're getting to a point that it's finally coming more on the priority list with the, you know, holistic approach. I know COVID pandemic definitely amplified many of the needs of this um, population and this disease, but also it created a much of a awareness around this as well. So where are we today with, you know, improvements that have been made over the past few years and what are some of the group of opportunities over the next few years as well? Wow, this is a very important topic. Yeah. Um, during the pandemic, need skyrocketed. However, the supply did not that was very difficult. The one good thing that I can see that came out of the pandemic is now um, a lot of um, mental health clinics are able to do things virtually. Yeah. So it's it's uh, made their a no-show rate plummet. Pa- patients will actually go and... Makes it easier to access. Access, yeah. right. It's Rather than if somebody who has issues having to go to an office that's a strange place. Mm-hmm. 
and that's a very difficult for them to do. So that's one of the better things. I think the reach has increased so much more. And, and you know, people have their own lives. They have to find childcare or transportation to the doctor's office, things along those lines. That's just, we just removed so many barriers just for them to show up to the appointment. So that's, that's hugely valuable. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and especially for mental health. Yes. Yes. But um, mental health is so important and um, it's something that it's part of my practice on a daily basis. And so there are some things that are easily treated with therapy or medication and some things are a lot more difficult. I think there are good things as far as access, great things as far as acceptance of needing to make sure you take care of yourself, like you take care of brushing your teeth, mm-hmm. brushing your hair, or taking care of your heart, or doing your yearly checkup, to be able to care for, for mental health in many communities, not all, uh, and access is improved. But it's still, we still need a lot more therapists, a lot more psychiatrists. Is the future, is the outlook for mental health good? Depends on the point of view. Okay, we gotcha. Live, <laughs> we live in a complicated world right yes. now. Yeah. Um, yes. There are, you know, wars and, and uh, social media is taking its toll on folks as mm-hmm. well. And so it, it's, the, our surroundings are not helping everyone's mental health. But I do think that there are less, there's less stigma around getting help for issues that okay. one has. So there's kind of yin and yang yeah. there. Next topic, and I'll start with Dr. McNeil on this one because you help or you lead our COVID response. And I don't think we can have a conversation about sort of a year in review without at least addressing COVID since it's still, it's still here, you know, it didn't go anywhere, but we just deal with it differently. So where are we at with COVID now? So there's changes in the disease process Mm -hmm. and then there's the changes in us. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So we're not in 2020 where we were all terrified, not knowing what we're doing, getting no sleep and running around constantly trying to figure out what we were doing with a disease nobody had ever heard of any longer. Now we have a little bit better handle around what we're dealing with and the effects of it and what to watch for and watching for infection rates and test kits and CVS or whichever pharmacy you choose to do. And so we have more power and more ownership around it than we've ever had. So that's, that's the good news. Mm-hmm. The kind of not as good as I'd like news is people have a tendency now at this point to just be assuming that it's no longer around. I see people in stores uh, just kind of in stranger spaces talking and, <laughs> doing it, and they're not really respectful of the respiratory season that we are within. It is important to respect it, to respect it, especially if one is older you know, compromised, uh, those folks we're still seeing land in hospitals and, and landing quite hard in that they are very, very ill. The disease itself is not as um, lethal as it was earlier, just to be clear. Mm-hmm. It certainly is not. Um, but I will say that I, I know I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want my 92-year-old mother to have yes. it. Yeah. Yes. And so it's just something that, you know, we're, we're respect, we, one should be respectful of it. One should still continue to get vaccinations appropriately as you would for flu and other things. Mm-hmm. And really, we in the medical community are respectful enough of it to continually watch its infection rates in our uh, communities as well as the admission rates in our hospitals as well to make sure that we are doing what we need for our employees and others to be protected. Yes. So in summary, it is important to respect it. It's not, we're by no means where we used to be, but it has not gone away. And so the public needs to know that you can't ignore the circumstance of it. It just is impossible to, to do to that do without that having consequences. Yes. But it's not the same. It's not the same. Okay. Are there other respiratory illnesses that we should be worried about or you know, thinking about this year? Sure. Uh, these are seasonal uh, somewhat, and of course the flu is here. Back to back, they come. They come yeah. as a they come as a trio. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> there's uh, COVID, there is influenza, and then there is RSV, which we still are, are battling. And you know, it's it's a problem for those at the very ends of the spectrum, right? Our, our infants and children, as well as our elderly, other people in the middle with all of these diseases have a tendency to also get them and suffer from them, and still can have significant impacts from them. But the most vulnerable at the end ends of that life spectrum. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> She's very well said. For yes. This, for this, yes. Yes. Well, I think the good thing about all these illnesses is that there's a similar strategies to tackle them all. You know, there's sure. there's vaccinations for you know most of them, and you could perform okay. 
hand hygiene and exactly. cover mm-hmm. your face or mask, put a mask on, yeah. things along those lines to Cough cover all your, these diseases. Absolutely. Cough into your elbow. Correct. Don't all be this. around people when you know that you are ill. Yeah. It's very common sense. All the, things, all the things that we did pre-COVID yes. or that we should have been doing too, should have been doing. <laughs> should have been doing. I've never been so aware over the last three years of washing my hands. I, I'll, I'll, I'll share. I, I went on a cruise and I was terrified this a couple of months ago because I just did not want to get COVID. My husband's immune compromised. Mm. I, we took all the precautions and I said, honey, I said, don't get upset with me. If I'm carrying around five bottles of hand sanitizer, we are going to be staying as healthy as possible. <laughs> and we did. And I was thankful for it. People might've looked at me strangely when I pulled out the hand sanitizer in the elevator, but I did it anyways. <laughs> There's a lot of power in washing your hands. There yeah. is. Yes. If you, you know, as yes. as keeping yourself safe uh, and, and disease yes. free, wash your hands. Yes. It's, it's not complicated. You have clean hands in addition yes. to being able to protect yourself from yeah. illness. So yep. it's a good thing yeah. to do. Mm-hmm. So Dr. McDean, one of the things he talked about was um, admission rates of the hospitals and just capacity and things along those sides. One of the things that we're, we've heard in the news is ER wait times and how that impacts, you know, patient care and, and some frustration around just long ED wait times. Especially here in Maryland. Especially in Maryland. Yeah. So what, what insight do you have around that aspect of it? You know, it's, it's unfortunate, but Maryland has the worst ED wait time uh, in the United States, meaning that our patients who come to the emergency department looking for care have a tendency, and not Adventist Healthcare, but in the entire state, have a tendency on average to wait longer than those patients who are coming to other states uh, that even those that might surround us, although D.C. has a similar problem. Uh, it is a challenge. It is one that hospitals have been battling and trying to accommodate for and strategize around for quite some time. We are a unique state in the way that we address healthcare, one in which the state sets limits at the amount of beds that are in the state. And I say that because, you know, if you are coming to the emergency department, patients who have to be admitted have to be admitted somewhere. And if that somewhere is full, that makes it difficult. In addition, patients who are already in the hospital as inpatients, once they're discharged, unless they're going home, they have to go somewhere like a rehab uh, or nursing home. And our state is a little compromised in that area as well. So there are multiple bottlenecks to be able to get patients through our our health system, Mm -hmm. basically. And the ER is that canary in a coal mine where everything buckles and and kind of boundaries up. And so the the ED wait times in this state are really um, a shame and they're difficult. Now, for the public who's wondering, what should I do? Should I just not go to the emergency department? The emergency departments exist in our health system and across the United States for reasons. And those are for emergencies. And so if you have... Uh, something that, frankly, you do not know what to deal with, and you have called your doctor and they've said go to the emergency department, for goodness sake, go to the emergency department. You will be what's called triaged, and they will see how ill you are and be able to put you in the queue in a way that will keep you safe. And uh, that is basically what, what you, as a human being, are just responsible to do as far as taking care of your health. Now, there was a time, which is lessening and lessening for folks, when people would come into the emergency department just because. I have a cold. I know it's a cold. I'm going to come in just because. I have a doctor, but, you know, emergency department's right there. I'm just going to walk over to the loop, see, yep. what, see what's I happening. I can't see him today. Can't see, or, you yeah. know, I can't see my doctor t- today or tomorrow or even uh, in three days. I want to know right now. Don't do not do that. If you know that you are quite safe, make an appointment with your doctor. There's urgent cares that are around as well, which is a, a great um, alternative to go to. If you believe you've broken a bone, you have a deep cut, you feel you're having chest pain, you have a headache that you can't get um, relief from, you feel like you're having a stroke. These things obviously are come examples yes. of, of things that you've got to come into the emergency department for immediately. But in my career as an emergency medicine physician, I've seen people for things that are as simple as paper cup, I'm not exaggerating, and mosquito bites, I once again am not exaggerating. <laughs> Uh, and so it's very important that you really use the emergency department for indeed what it's meant for, it's- which is emergencies. Dr. Meyer, you mentioned you have experience in, in talking through this. Anything to add? <clears throat> no, except that the only other thing which I'll mention is, from my perspective, there's a, a, a dearth of providers, both nurses, physicians, medical assistants in all of all in the whole area. It seems to have been brought to the fore by the pandemic, but we're struggling now trying to hire anybody. Mm-hmm. So it's very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a resource challenge as well to make sure the right personnel is to take care of the sta- uh, patients that we're seeing in, with the, from our community. So mm-hmm. definitely a challenge as well. 
Very much so. I mean, the hospitals have done, Advanced Healthcare, I'll say specifically, to, you know, talking about what I know, has really strategized to make sure that we had the right people in place in our acute care setting. But still, the emergency department in particular is hard because it's hard to work there. You're on your feet all the time. People don't get bathroom breaks or lunch breaks because it's so busy. And so there is a bit of turnover there. And so you're right about that that resource. But it's both inside as far as inpatient as well as outpatient oh, staffing. It really is a challenge absolutely. as opposed to what it was a decade ago, for instance. Okay. All right. Next one. So one of the things we saw this year was there was a football player who had a cardiac arrest in the field. There was a lot of talks about it. And, and you know, people may not understand why that occurs or how that occurs or what to do about it. You know, this could happen in somebody's home, too. So, A, why does that occur? And B, what can people do about it to prepare for it or or just reduce the there? risk of reduce it? Reduce the risk, yeah. yeah. I'll start and say that it's always surprising when somebody who's healthy and in their 20s, for instance, which would be the example you gave, um, had a cardiac arrest, especially have a cardiac arrest and then die, uh, would also is always shocking. It happens, though. It happens rarely. So I want to make sure that the Public large once again understands that this is unlikely to happen to you or your your for instance teenager. It's unlikely to happen, but it's not not impossible. The younger people who have this occur usually have uh, uh, either a structural heart pr- problem or an arrhythmia. An arrhythmia means that your heart beats irregularly in a way that does not let you put blood flow to the areas of your body that you need to survive. Now. There's also heart disease that happens when people have a heart attack, which is different, Mm -hmm. blockage. And those are a little bit more um, predictable in that you you have chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, sweatiness. They're in the movies, so to speak. And so Mm -hmm. there's something that people have some reference for. And the way to prevent that is to eat right and exercise and take care of yourself and see your doctor regularly, know what your cholesterol and your lipids are, which are how much fat you're carrying around in your bloodstream, you know. Those types of things are preventive. They work well. Uh, Going to the doctor works well. For the younger group, you know, I do know that folks before athletic engagements as far as school is concerned, in other words, have health um, examinations. And a lot of times, a lot of these things can be picked up on a simple EKG. People Mm -hmm. have uh, diseases in the heart, like hypertrophic, you know, heart disease, for instance, that can be uh, in, in younger folks. You can see that on an EKG more than less and, and be able to look into it more carefully. The problem is, as you said, it shows up on an EKG, but yeah. we don't usually do an EKG on uh. somebody with a low risk, like mm-hmm. a younger person. So that's a very difficult question. But mm-hmm. the very fact that it occurs rarely means that when it happens to the football player, it's news because it's a rare, mm-hmm. yeah. rare mm-hmm. situation. But It's something we all worry about, but it's still very rare situation. Yeah. I think one of the things we talked about in this podcast is about going to your yearly checkups and yeah. having the conversation with your provider. I think with younger population, younger adults, you see less of a compliance or need for people to go to the um, to their primary care provider or having those transparent conversations. So I think even beginning from that, sharing your family history, your mm-hmm. medical history, or things you're feeling and talking or, you know, sensing, just having that kind of conversation, you know, is, is hugely beneficial to avoid such severe events that are very rare to begin with. Mm-hmm. Right. I will say to the public, and I, don't, I actually don't know the data on how engaged the public is in learning CPR, Yeah, for mm-hmm. instance. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, churches offer it at times. Uh, hospitals offer it at times. I was going to say, we offer it here. We offer it we here. Offer it here. <laughs> Community centers offer it. You know, if you have that time, and uh, consider, even if you don't, consider carving that time out to learn what you should do if someone collapses around you because – the ways that you interact as far as uh, CPR can save someone's life, they are not complicated, uh, and uh, you can do quite a bit of good. Thank you. One of our last ones, I think this year there was some news about artificial sweeteners ah. um, and a possible link to cancer. Can you so, walk us through that a little bit? Absolutely. So aspartame, there was a question about aspartame and, and causing cancer, specifically liver cancer. Mm. Now that was, we don't Medicine is not in agreement about this. <laughs> this was from a branch, the uh, research arm of the WHO. Okay. And they listed it as being a possible risk. Mm. Other um, cancer research organizations have said not so much. FDA is 
has agreed with that part. Mm -hmm. And it is not incredibly obvious that there's a connection. That there's a link. Okay. One thing I will say that about artificial sweeteners, which is that actually, so if you look at things like sodas, diet sodas versus regular sodas, it turns out that they both cause weight gain. Artificial sweeteners, they're trying to avoid the you know, things like excess weight, excess calories, and it's just doesn't help that much. Yeah, so it's, you know, if you're going to... It's more of a part of a... Water is much better than... Yes, yes. It's, like yes. it's more sweetener. about maybe what you're eating in your diet that could be causing... Could right. be increasing your risk and not just that one ingredient. Right. And that too, yes. Okay. People assume, though, that they need um, a beverage to be sweet. And I have to say, just personal experience, and I'm going to put my bias out here today, you know, there are definitely things that I like to be sweet. Um, and like to eat them in moderation and, and enjoy them. Um, but people, I've seen people put or ask for the number of sweeteners they have in their hot drinks, for instance, which is where I see people most likely add mm -hmm. artificial sweetener to. I would advocate people to try with just less, just less sugar, mm. <laughs> just less yeah. sugar, less aspartame. Just try it with less to see if you can get acclimated to that uh, or choose some other beverage that has, has uh, not the need for it at all. I just, I don't know, I mean, I remember... Back when we were we were young, <laughs> yeah, these things did not exist. Uh, and there still there wasn't the thirty six percent or so uh, morbid obesity you're walking around. So there's something wrong with the way that we're eating, and it might be a good idea to consider assumptions you have in place about putting artificial sweetener or any sweetener mm -hmm. in in large amounts mm -hmm. in anything. I like what you said though. Like just put less, and we've yes, talked about that on this podcast a lot a lot of times. Small steps. You don't have to do everything. All at once. Moderation. Moderation. But just take little steps. Like if it's five that you typically do, cut that down a little bit and see if you can, you know. So you don't have to do it all all you don't at have once. To do it all. And I, I say moderation because I'm not going to sit here and tell you I don't like cake. I like cake. <laughs> I like cake a lot. I like cookies. I like uh, hard candies. It's the season. Yep. Come on now. Halloween just passed. Christmas is here. Easter's coming. I like candy. <laughs> okay. Am I eating candy all day every day? No. Am I eating it once in a while? Yes, and I think that it's important to curate yeah. what people are putting in their mouth. Yes. I think that's yeah. the difference between having the dessert coffee that people drink in the morning every yes. day versus having black coffee or just walk yes. coffee with a couple of sweeteners oh. as opposed to a whole. Nimitz saw bread. that gingerbread latte on my desk <laughs> earlier. <laughs> or, or having that gingerbread latte once a week, yeah. yes. not every day every of the day. week. You yeah. know? So there's, there's opportunities to, to uh, like I said, to dial back instead of eliminate. Yeah, I like that. Were there any other uh, topics or things that came out that you all can think of before we go? We're all running at the at the speed of sound, We're taking care of kids and life and school and this and that, and just slow down enough to make sure that you're doing the things you need to do. Brush your teeth, floss, see your doctor. Make sure our glasses are up to date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Get sleep. some exercise. Get Get some, some exercise. exercise. Sleep at night. Put down the Big Mac. You know, just a, <laughs> you know, just a few things. These are small things that help your life uh, quality be better and your longevity of higher quality as well. Okay. I think that's a great way to end uh, not only this the, the podcast today, but also kind of lead us into the holidays and into 2024. Just take some baby steps. Take care of yourself mentally, physically, and spiritually to lean on our mission here at Adventist Healthcare. Absolutely. Thank you both for coming in. We really appreciate your time and all that you do for Adventist Healthcare and for our community and patients. Thank you. As we uh, wrap up this year as well, I want to say thank you to our listeners. And actually, especially thank you to Nimit for taking time out of his day to come Absolutely. too and be it's my be my be my co-host. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you to our listeners for tuning in all year long. We hope you have found our podcast to be helpful. Please follow us so you get all our new episodes. And don't forget to connect with Adventist Healthcare. Go to AdventistHealthcare.com. Thank you and be well. Bye.